Thank you everyone for joining us. It'll take Zoom about a minute or so to add everybody into the room. So please sit tight and we'll get started in a few moments. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we're just gonna give it about 20 more seconds to allow Zoom time to get everybody into the room and then we'll get started. Thanks for joining us. Okay, hopefully Zoom has had time to get everybody in the room now. So we will go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to the latest Duke Media Briefing on the COVID-19 pandemic and its effects on society. I'm Gregory Phillips with Duke Communications and I'll be moderating this event. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers and get the discussion started and then we will open it up to questions. We are recording this briefing and that recording will be sent to everyone who registered. The topic today is uh, the pandemic's impact on the economy and what we can maybe expect going forward. Thanks to every uh, reporter that joined already sent questions. Um, during this discussion, those of you joining us on Zoom can submit questions via the Q&A window at any time. There will also be an opportunity to ask questions in person in a few minutes. Thanks also to everyone watching this on YouTube. So to our participants, uh, with us today is Sarah Bloom Raskin. She is a visiting professor of the practice of the Duke School of Law. Uh, she is a former deputy secretary of the US Department of Treasury and a former governor on the Federal Reserve Board. Good morning. Also joining us is Campbell Harvey. He is a professor of finance at the Fuqua School of Business at Duke. He's also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, a past president of the American Finance Association and a founding director of the Duke CFO Survey. Good morning. Good morning, Greg. And we have Connell Fullenkamp. He is a professor of the practice and director of undergraduate studies in the Department of Economics at Duke's Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. He studies financial market development and the regulation of financial markets. Good morning to you. Good morning. Okay, Professor Harvey, we'll start with you. You've called this economic moment a great compression in which the recovery from a sudden and deep economic crisis could also be very swift, what's often called a V-shaped recovery. But with the calamitous second quarter numbers we've just seen, what's your current take on the recovery and what do you think we should expect from the next few months? Yeah, th thanks, Greg. So I have characterized this as a, uh, a great compression. Uh, we've seen unprecedented uh, bad news. Um, but the nature of this particular episode is so different than what we've seen in modern history. So during the global financial crisis, we had no idea when the crisis would end. When would the recession end? Actually, it was dated over in 2009, but it continued. Unemployment continued to go up into 2010, and it took nine years to get back to where we started. So there was a lot of uncertainty. It dragged on. This recession is short because it's a biological recession, and the solution is a biological solution. And there's widespread belief that we will have uh, an effective vaccine uh, deployed. So, so all of the bad news is compressed and we will also see unprecedented good news. However, I think it's naive to think that it will be exactly V-shaped. By the end of the year or the first quarter, we're back to where we started. That doesn't make any sense. And I think people make uh, a basic mistake of uh, percentage growth. Um, even though we are down 32%, if we're up 32%, we're not back to where we started. You know, if you do the math, if you start at 100 and then you drop 50%, you go to 50. And then if you gain 50%, you're back to 75. So I think it's naive to think that we're going back to where we started. It's naive to think that uh, there's no structural damage, no permanent damage, even though we've taken on all of this debt and firms are, are going out of business. And I think it's naive um, to think that this, we can just brush it over and uh, we'll be back exactly where we started. And what is really puzzling to me is that's exactly the belief of the stock market right now, where the, the stock market is effectively discounted uh, the entire COVID-19 crisis, and we're back to where we started. So that to me is very uh, worrisome, and I think it's reflective of uh, a, a sort of bias that people have right now. And I call it rose-colored glasses, that we're looking 
had this crisis and discounting it and basically saying, it's gonna be gone, we're back to where we were, when I think the damage um, is much more permanent. Absolutely, thank you. Certainly lots to dig into uh, there, but I would like to move on to you, Professor Raskin. Um, as a former Deputy, Tre Deputy Treasury Secretary, what policy recommendations would you be making in this moment where we are right now? Sure, well, thanks, Greg, and thank you everybody for joining this call. Um, uh, first of all, I guess I would move very quickly this morning before anyone figured out that I was still at the Treasury Department um, to implement short-term policy changes, medium-term policy changes, and long-term policy changes. So let me explain why. First of all, um, as Cam explained, you know, the current state of the economy is quite fragile. Uh, we are experiencing very slow growth. Um, job losses have become permanent. Um, more than 16 million people are still looking for jobs. Bankruptcies are soaring um, and businesses um, are not recovering evenly. So um, the economy is at a quite fragile point. And of course, this is highly linked to the fragility of the public health situation. So the US health crisis is ongoing, um, averaging in the US 1,000 deaths a day still from the pandemic, 50,000 new cases um, every day. So um, we have here a linked um, pandemic and healthcare crisis with an economic crisis. And they are highly dependent and intertwined um, with each other. And the, the tragic flaw here is the absence really of a public health recovery plan because without such a public health recovery plan, our ability to move to a full economic recovery is jeopardized. We, were, we, we will not get there. Um, at the rate we are going um, without, a, without a plan. So this idea of the pandemic and the economic recovery being intertwined and highly linked, I think is, is important. Now, to your question, the short-term policy changes. So what would I do or recommend be done immediately? So in the very short term, we have to restore and improve economic support, okay? That means there needs to be something more than this um, illusory, meager, um, ephemeral set of executive orders that have come out regarding different kinds of support. Um, so we need as a first matter to restore and improve the support. You've got to remember that the support let, ended on July 31st over okay so people do not have households do not have small businesses do not have the support they need uh to move into the next couple of months there has not been a deal okay that would be the first thing i would do is get a deal in place the second thing i would do is i would check on the apparatus for delivery of the support right so one thing that was learned uh from the from the implementation of the CARES Act was that the infrastructure is creaky. It takes time to get this money out the door. Uh, there's been an underinvestment really in the IT systems, in the um, ability to move forward quickly uh, with support. Um, that we've got to fix. So the second thing I would do in the short term, in addition to restoring and improving the economic support, is I would um, check on the apparatus um, for the delivery of the support. So those are short term, sort of the short term focal points. Now, at the same time, we have to think about the medium term. Now, in the medium term, we've got to get this recovery more traction, um, which means essentially that we need to invest more in the delivery mechanisms that I talked about, in the uh, technology that is used to deliver uh, assistance to households. What am I talking about here? Things like real-time payment, okay? We need to be thinking ahead here. We have extraordinary technology. Why have we not invested in it and used it uh, for, the, for the public good? Um, so the first thing I would, would do in the medium term is to invest in these delivery mechanisms. Um, and secondly, I would 
adjust the balance of the targeted fiscal support with the broad monetary policy support. So in other words, we have two forms of economic support going out the door, one on the fiscal side, one on the monetary policy side. We need to pause and adjust the balance there. Why does the balance matter? Because the speed with which the recovery occurs is going to depend on those two mechanisms, which have very different audiences and different targets. Fiscal support, very targeted to households, small businesses. The monetary policy support, much more targeted to the large corporate, uh, corporate entities and of course the asset holders. So we've got to think about that. And we, I would argue we don't have that right. Finally, in the long term, what I would do is be thinking about building back the economy, economy in a much more sustainable way. We are spending a lot of money. We are saddling the next generation with very high costs. We should be spending this money prudently. And what does that mean? It means thinking more carefully about how the money is getting spent. Okay, now we can, we've got to like, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time. We've got to get the relief out the door. I'm not dismissing that need at all. I'm saying, let's think about what kind of relief we're providing and what the return on investment is for the public in terms of that relief. So that would be one thing I would be focusing people on thinking about for the longer term. And finally, we've got to be preparing for emerging risks to financial stability. What comes to mind? Climate change, okay? We need to be thinking about the risks on the horizon, okay? When we don't think about those risks, we are not prepared. And when we're not prepared, we see what happens. We can see the grave consequences that come with an ill-prepared response to emerging risk. So the final thing I would do in the long term is I would be preparing us for emerging risks to financial stability. And I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. That was a very comprehensive opening. And I know that our other panelists will probably have some uh, input to offer on that too. But before we get to that, I would like to come to you, Professor Fullenkamp. Um, you've said recently that there's a need for better information on the pandemic so that people can plan more confidently and certainly for the future. How much of a difference can that make? And what do you expect to see happen since we are continuing to get mixed messages um, out of our leaders in Washington right now? Yeah, thanks very much, Greg. I, as uh, our other panelists have talked about, there, there, we have this compressed uh, recession. We have a lot of problems going on in the economy. And I'm digging down into the reasons behind that. And one of the big reasons, of course, is uncertainty. Since our economy is 70% consumption, and consumption itself is driven in, in large part by people's sentiment, their outlook about the future, then uncertainty is really going to be play a huge role here because people have been living in fear for, for months now. Um, I think there are two things that our government could be doing to improve the information outlook, to give people confidence, to get them back into the economy and back to as much as they can back to their normal activities and get the economy moving again. One level is at the individual level. People need to know what what the real risk is of their different daily activities. Um, it, we still don't really understand how transmission works very well and what the risks are of, 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 of meeting in groups, of going to restaurants, of going into stores and things like that, for example. So there's, we're getting more and more data and it, it really would be helpful if the government could give us a, a better understanding of what these risks really are. I feel confident that if people could move from uncertainty where they don't understand or know anything that could possibly happen into, a, into a, a picture of risk where they understand some of the more probabilistic ways, they can make better decisions and feel more confident about, uh, about everyday activities. And I think that's a big part of getting the economy moving again. At the bigger level though, the government also needs to give us a much better picture of what's really happening with the evolution of the pandemic. Um, in the past month, for example, we've had a lot of cold water thrown on a nascent recovery because of an increase in cases. But we really don't understand what the increase in cases is. Is it an abnormal reblossoming or a second wave of the pandemic? Or is it just the normal, pro the normal progression of, of a biological phenomenon going through a population? Um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, we talked about flattening the curve but the curve still goes up and it still has a steep part. 
So if the government came and told people, gosh, this is a normal part of the progression of the pandemic, what you're doing is correct, keep doing it, and, and there's only so much we can do about it, I think that, would, that could possibly help. Right now, what we have are many voices, some of them coming from upper levels of the government, creating even more uncertainty. For example, uh, the president of the Minneapolis Fed this week was advocating for another hard lockdown of four to six weeks. So when we're hearing mixed messages, as you said about that from the government, it's just sowing more uncertainty. So people think, gosh, am I, am I really ever gonna go back to work? Is it really safe to go outside? Is it really good to send my kids back to school? All of these things that we need to start happening in our, we need to have start happening in our economy to get it back on track are not going to happen until and unless we get better information and, and until we, we feel safer and more confident. And I think the government could play a big coordinating role here. And it, and it, really, it, it really should step up and do that because we've had uh, many months of data. There's, there, there's literally reams and, and warehouses full of data that we could take advantage of to figure some of these questions out and slowly but surely start to rebuild confidence so that we can really get back to that recovery. Until we do, I completely agree with Cam that our, that our recovery is going to be halting at best. It's going to be very, very, uh, very, very uneven. Gotcha, thank you very much uh, for that. Certainly there is a need for better information across the board right now, it would seem. Thanks to all the panelists for those opening comments. Um, we will now open it up to questions. If you um, are on the call and would like to pose a question, you can raise your hand um, in Zoom and we can unmute you so that you can uh, ask your question in person if you would like to do that, or you can pose a question in the Q&A. Uh, if you are joining by phone, you can hit star nine to ask a question. Um, Cam, I would like to come back to you uh, first off. If I may, um, uh, Sarah Raskin, Professor Raskin outlined some of the steps that, um, that she would like to take. Um, but what, what's your take on uh, what you think should be happening right now um, when we look at you know, the, the benefits to corporations versus uh, some of the efforts that the government has made to provide relief for, for families? So I have a different set of priorities. So let me give you my take. So basically what we're doing is we're throwing money in the wrong places. So we're supporting businesses, which is fine. We're supporting people, which is fine. But there's another priority. And the priority is to basically halt the spread of the disease. And the way to do that is fairly simple. And that is massive testing. And it is inexplicable to me that we have had six months, and this is well known in, in public health, that we need to test. We're testing indeed the wrong people. We're testing the people that already have the COVID-19. We should be testing everybody. And again, we've had six months to do this and we've made very little progress. So if we wanna mitigate the spread of this disease, you know, before we get a vaccine, this is the way to do it. Look, less than 10% of the public funding is being allocated to uh, vaccine research, pharmacological research, and, and testing and, and tracing. The priorities are, are totally backwards to me, that this is a historic failure in public health policy. The number one thing we should be doing is investing in testing. The cost is enormous. The people that are unemployed, uh, and, and don't believe the headline unemployment rate, because it doesn't count all of the people that are receiving other types of assistance uh, from the government. We've got 30 million people unemployed. We're paying almost $2 billion a day to support that. What we should be doing is taking some of that money and investing in the testing. So everybody is tested once a week. It can be done, but we're not doing it. it and what Colin was talking about in terms of reducing uncertainty, I 100% agree with. And this is the way to do it when you're regularly tested. So again, uh, it's frustrating. This is not just about economic policy. It's about public health policy. Both of them are intertwined. We can substantially mitigate the economic risk. We can substantially mitigate the uncertainty. We can put our economy back on track faster than waiting for the vaccine to be deployed with a testing policy. Yet we're not doing that. And it's very disappointing. 
Uh, certainly, uh, I think you're right that we need more testing. That seems to be certainly beyond doubt. Um, Professor Fullenkamp, I'd like to come back to you briefly uh, because Professor Raskin outlined some of the steps that she would take um, and Cam obviously would like to see uh, some more financial resources put into testing. Um, but if you had, if you held economic purse strings right now, um, what would be some of the, what would you be looking at first? Um, how much do you, do you think that we need to make a choice between testing and providing relief for families? Uh, what, what, would, what would be your take if you were, if you were running things right now? Well, I certainly agree with a lot of Sarah's points, um, and I and I think that we're at a point in history where where we really shouldn't uh, be paying as much attention to the purse strings as we normally try to do. So I think that we, if we needed, if we really had the will to do more testing, we shouldn't really worry about the expense as much. Um, an additional consideration that that has really been uh, weighing on my mind as I think about the economy is uh, the, the the looming problem with with evictions and foreclosures. Uh, you know, we have kind of a stopgap measure in place for some government uh, uh, supported mortgages, but we have, you know, millions upon millions of families who are who are going to be uh, threatened with foreclosure and eviction because of the of the of the cessation of the unemployment support payments. And, you know, we're on what, what now the fourth or fifth rent cycle or mortgage cycle. And there just is a there's just a hard upper bound on the amount of uh, 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 on the on the, the length that that can continue based on what we know about household finances. People just don't have that much in terms of rainy day funds. And certainly when you go down the income scale, you certainly go down the well scale as well. So people just don't have the savings to uh, to support uh, to support continued rent payments when they don't have jobs. So one of the things that I would add would be a comprehensive package to think to to address uh, the the whole rental economy. Uh, and, and we have to address it from both sides because for, for many individuals, uh, the, the, a rental income is a big source of income for them. So it's not just a matter of a rent moratorium or a rent strike. It's a matter of a comprehensive package to try to, to, try to keep everybody in the system whole so that we can make it through this patch and then, and then pick up on the other end and, and get back to normal business. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Professor Raskin, I'd like to come back to you. Um, you outlined you know, a comprehensive number of steps you would take in the short, medium to long term. And Professor Harvey has obviously emphasized you know, this need for testing. Do you think that that's a binary choice? Do you think that um, the, the government is, is able to step up and, and um, take care of its responsibilities regarding doing widespread testing, as we've seen in other countries, um, while also taking care of families and taking the other economic steps? Or do you think that you know, there is some compromise that has to happen between those two goals? Oh, it's an excellent point. And I think, I think uh, Professor Harvey got it right. I mean, I think, again, that these crises are linked. And to think about solving the economy without solving the underlying health situation is, is really, a, you know, a, a, a grand waste of, of, the, of, of effort. We are never, as I said, we're never going to get a full recovery if we don't address the, uh, the underlying um, uh, spread of the pandemic. And if it takes testing, that's what we need to be investing in. If it takes tracing, that's what we need to be investing in. That, you know, in other words, and, there, and, and we have no plan. And this goes really to Canel's point, right? There is no, there's no certainty. There's no sense of how to reduce the uncertainty. People are really flailing um, at the business level, at the household level. At the individual level, and um, and I and I and I would agree with with both um, other both of the panelists that the health side needs to be addressed, um, and until it is addressed and addressed sufficiently, um, we are not going to have a full economic recovery. Um, my sort of what what I was focused on in terms of the priorities was what. Uh, would the, you know, the role of treasury be in terms of bringing about an economic recovery, given that there are, have been sufficient resources put into, um, into what, uh, what, what Cam calls a his, the historic failure of, the, uh, of public health planning. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Um, we have a, a hand raised um, uh, among the attendees. So if we can go ahead and uh, unmute. Uh, our participant, please go ahead and uh, tell us who you are, who you're with, and pose your question, please. Hi, it's David Borax with WFAE in Charlotte, the NPR station here. Uh, this is a question related to the idea of testing for Professor Harvey. Um, we've seen testing uh, has worked well along with contact tracing in other places and uh, has helped uh, limit the spread of the disease. But in the U.S., we have a different situation. First of all, we've gotten way too started way too late on this. Second of all, there's a massive resistance to uh, testing and contact tracing here. 
We're having public health officials tell us that uh, people aren't answering their phones, aren't providing the information. Is it realistic to, to think that even with more testing that we could prevent the spread of the disease? Are people going to do the quarantining and isolation that's required to do that? I mean, we're in a mode right now where uh, COVID fatigue has everybody thinking we need to just get back to normal. So again, this has been um, a historic failure uh, of public health policy. And I understand in the United States, uh, it is complicated because of the federal kind of state uh, system. Uh, in other countries, it's a lot more straightforward where you've got a federal government in, that can mandate uh, policy across uh, different states or provinces. So I, I totally understand that. And it is very unfortunate that this pandemic has been politicized also. And some of the issues that you're talking about in terms of resistance uh, to wear a mask or uh, to be tested uh, is really a political issue. So we've had multiple failures of leadership uh, from the leadership in Washington to the leadership across the different states. And I think that the case just hasn't been clearly made to people that what we need to do is to reduce the, uh, the super spreaders. We need to identify those with the disease when they're spreading it and they might be asymptomatic. So it's fairly straightforward to do. We need to make these tests as easy as possible uh, to do. We have not invested in the technology the way that we should have invested in the technology. And the result is a tragic, uh, unnecessary loss of life and loss of well being and massive carnage in the economy in general. So the case needs to be made by our policy uh, leaders that this is a way that we can substantially mitigate this crisis. The cost is fairly low compared to what we're paying already. And again, and, and this is like a really good point that Connell made, that people feel really nervous. Uh, they're, they're scared when they actually go out. And that affects uh, economic behavior and, and social behavior. And we can mitigate that by having widespread, um, like on demand, once a week, a test for everybody. So again, I'm looking for uh, leadership, not just to support people that have been put out of work due to this natural disaster. And that's what this is, right? You're out of work, not because you did a bad job, not because you were fired, it's because of a natural disaster. And we've got a long tradition in the United States of supporting uh, people um, that have suffered from a natural disaster, not their fault. So I, I totally get that but we need to have as the number one priority, um, the biological threat. This situation is a biological situation, it's obvious. And we need to allocate resources to support the mitigation of the spread of the disease. And we have failed to do that. Thank you, Professor Harvey. I think uh, people all across the country share, share your flabbergasted response to uh, how the country has handled the pandemic so far. Um, I want to get back to this issue, um, the, the structural economic damage uh, that's potentially being done here. And I'd like to, Professor Fullenkamp, I'll start with you, but I want to get everybody's input on this question. Um, so we've seen uh, recently, as Professor Harvey alluded to in his opening remarks, um, stock market performance that seems greatly at odds with all the uncertainty in the country and uh, the, the families that are suffering, people losing their jobs and small businesses wondering, you know, restaurants and others, whether they'll even be able to survive. Given the current stock market situation, are we headed for a precipice uh, because the economy, because the, the stock market doesn't seem to be reflecting uh, the current economic conditions and the total amount of uncertainty over there? Or is there something we're missing? Well, I hate to give an economist response, but the answer is really perhaps. Uh, I, I agree with I agree very much with Cam that that part of the problem is that obviously a lot of investors are looking at the market with with rose colored glasses. I think another big part of the, the the picture is the the fact that the Fed's actions to to cram interest rates uh, as low as possible have led uh, led us back to the sentiment that there is no alternative uh, to stock investing, and I think that's that's led to to stampedes of people into the stock market as well. If you couple that with uh, the uh, 
the, the, the simultaneous uh, drop of, of trading commissions down to zero and the fact that people are at home with lots of time on their hands, there's also an element of speculation that's crept into the American market that we really haven't seen you know, since the, since the first dot-com bubble. So all of these things are combining to give us this storm of, uh, of a surge of, 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 of flows into the stock market, which is really, again, decoupling the stock market performance with economic performance. But one thing that I, that I find really fascinating and uh, has historic precedent is if you really get, get, uh, get into the details about which stocks are driving the indices up, that the, the, the rise in the indices is concentrated in rather a small set of firms, mostly the big, the big tech giants. Um, and if you look historically at uh, the run-ups to big, to big market crashes and, and falls, you do see a typical pattern of, of the, the, the rises in the stock market being concentrated in fewer and fewer firms, leading to this big dispersion of returns uh, in, in the background that are covered up by the index numbers. Uh, and this was certainly the case, say, in the run-up to, the, to the, cry, the crash of 29. It was also something that we saw in the run-up uh, to, the, to the panic of 2008 as well. So it, there's some really, there's some, really um, some, some, some disturbing signs in the market, shall we say. And of course, we, we all know the adage that the stock market has, pre has predicted the last nine, nine of the last five recessions. So it's, it's really hard to say. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Professor Raskin, um, uh, what, what's your take on, on how the stock market is acting right now, given all the uncertainty in the world? Right. So I think I think uh, Professor Follenkamp has it right. Uh, the Fed here has moved in an extraordinary way, um, not just in terms of moving to the zero lower bound and having the Fed funds rate set at zero, but but in fact engaging in quite novel um, and unproven. Um, new forms of monetary accommodation. So in addition to having uh, the Fed funds rate set at zero, the Fed also is engaging in unlimited amounts of quantitative easing. Now, quantitative easing is something that was done during the financial crisis. Um, it had not been tested really before that. We know it has long-term uh, effects on the, uh, on, on the economy, uh, but the Fed um, very, very early in the crisis um, did, you know, engage, did sort of let, let out the quantitative easing, you know, sort of let out the quantitative easing tigers quite, quite early. And I might add, there is even more going on, okay, in terms of novel monetary policy accommodation. The Fed is purchasing corporate debt, okay? So the effects of the purchases of corporate debt at the same time, it's engaging in the purchases of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities in an unlimited, unending way has produced a role for the Fed that is, I think, going to be one that's going to be very hard to unwind. Here, the Fed has, in effect, put a floor on the prices of equities and debt, okay? This has, in essence, kept the markets higher, some might argue, than they would otherwise be. And we know, by the way, that markets now are very sensitive to any kind of inclination that the Fed might, you know, put an end date on uh, its extraordinary purchasing activity, or that the Fed might somehow scale back its purchases. When, when that happens, markets actually jolt uh, quite significant, significantly, which really makes it tough for the Fed, you know, at the right time to be pulling back. So, um, you know, so I think that the, the role of the Fed is absolutely um, critical in understanding what is going on and why we have this fundamental unhinging between the real economy and, and the stock market. And by the way, there are effects to this, and we could, you know, talk about those as well, when you, in essence, uh, unhinge the economy from markets and who is benefiting from those uh, from those policy moves, and of course, what it means long term in terms of how the Fed could actually contract when it needs to um, further down the road. Thank you, Professor Raskin. Uh, Professor Harvey, uh, obviously, you kind of summarized your approach to the stock market in your opening remarks. Um, but uh, I'd like to hear any other thoughts you have on it. But I'm also curious, in your opening remarks, you talked about, even though you feel like the recovery will recovery will be quicker than it maybe was during the Great Recession, that there will be some structural damage to the economy. And I'm wondering if you could talk about what kind of longer term structural uh, effects you're talking about and how that could affect kind of families, business owners and investors. Sure. Um, so 
let me comment on a few things. First, uh, the stock market, while it's at all time high, um, we need to understand something really important. And Connell kind of pointed this out, that the recovery in the stock market is uneven. So if you look at the, the, uh, the top 10 stocks, and we all know the names, you know, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, they're up like over 30%. Yet, if you look at the rest of the market, think of it as the S&P 490, it's down. Okay, so this is a really uneven recovery uh, in the stock market. And yes, I do think that Sarah's point about the Fed put, uh, and, and that's the idea that there's kind of a floor um, for the stock market and the Fed is very careful to watch uh, the stock market uh, ever since maybe 1996 and Alan Greenspan. So I agree that that is a really important uh, force. However, uh, it doesn't really apply to most, most of the stocks. Uh, many companies are struggling. And what we've seen is a surge in the so-called growth stocks. Okay, so that's the number uh, one thing that this is an uneven sort of recovery in the stock market. But nevertheless, we're at an all-time high and it's really hard to understand how we got there. So I go back to March and that was the, the month of maximum uncertainty where we didn't know how bad this pandemic would actually get. And at that time, uh, the stock market uh, plunged you know, 35%. And it was also interesting that uh, assets that sometimes would be considered safe haven assets, like gold, plunged. And the new gold, so supposedly, um, Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency, it lost over 50%. So at that time, people were fleeing uh, risky assets and investing in safe assets, cash and government bonds, and the rates went down. But then when the uncertainty started to uh, be reduced, the Fed came in with this unprecedented um, uh, sort of uh, monetary policy where they're actively in the market buying risky assets. Uh, it became a situation that's known as uh, quote, risk on, unquote. So that meant that people started to pile back into the stock market, including some of the retail and speculative investors. People started to buy gold and people started to buy um, Bitcoin. And look where we are right now. The stock market at an all-time high, gold near an all-time high, and a 100% return on the cryptocurrencies um, from, from the trough. Okay, so, so this is a situation, again, um, of speculation, uneven speculation, and I think that we're not viewing the risks in a balanced way. There are real risks out there. So the quantitative easing, in contrast to the global financial crisis, this quantitative easing is unlimited. And we've never been in a situation like that before. We've created an unprecedented uh, amount of money. We don't see any inflation right now and the expectation of inflation is about 1.6% over the next 10 years. However, that could change. And if there is a surge in inflation, that's gonna be very negative for businesses and it will be especially negative for the people in our society that um, are the most disadvantaged because inflation is a tax. And those um, that pay for it are those that can least afford it. And that poses a structural risk uh, to the economy. The other issue that's very important is on the fiscal side, where we have not hesitated to spend. We have not hesitated to take more debt. We don't have a rainy day fund because over the last 10 years, in positive economic growth situations, the federal government has chosen to run a large deficit. If they had chosen to run a surplus, we might've had a rainy day fund. No, we don't have that. And I agree that we have basically put this onto the next generation and that 
creates a structural issue in the longer term and in the shorter term, because many companies have taken on debt. And one of the risks that I see that I've talked about in my LinkedIn is the so-called debt overhang problem, where a good high quality company to get through the crisis has taken on debt and they've got perhaps a good idea an innovation that maybe could return 30% per year. They go to their bank and their bank says, we can't lend you the money to finance this because you are over levered right now. That project is never pursued. And what this does is eliminate these opportunities for high growth projects. These are the projects exactly that can drive us uh, out of this recession and put us on a course to higher growth in the future. Yet this debt overhang negatively affects companies that uh, could positively contribute to the recovery. So those are just like two aspects of the structural risk. The third one is kind of obvious that in the short term, we've seen bankruptcies, but the bankruptcies we've seen, you could characterize as accelerations of something that was gonna happen anyways. So we knew that JCPenney is gonna go bankrupt. Some of the big box retailers, we knew that they were gonna go bankrupt in today's uh, sort of economy. This was just an acceleration. The structural damage, the third level of structural damage is when high quality firms that had a good future have to go bankrupt because they just can't get through this. The government policy has been trying to mitigate that and to minimize the structural damage. But at some point, given that we've done a poor job of mitigating the uh, public health issue, uh, at some point, we're gonna see some high quality firms and maybe they're not firms that we recognize the names of. There are so many small and medium sized businesses that are so crucial for the economy that are high quality, profitable, contributing positively to economic growth that will go under and that will negatively affect our prospects in the future. Thank you, Professor Harvey. Uh, certainly a lot of structural issues there. Um, Professor Raskin, I want to come back to you and um, Professor Willenkamp, I'll come to you next because I want to talk about um, the US's role, uh, you know, we're, we're a global citizen and an enormous economy that has effects on, on other countries. And one of the things I'm curious about, given that we know uh, for whatever the political or medical reasons that the, uh, the pandemic is currently very, very bad in the US, worse than it is in a lot of other large countries, is there, does that pose a risk to the economy in that the US relies a lot on foreign investment and uh, a lot of uh, foreign held US debt? Um, is there a, a risk that countries start to see the US as not a kind of place where they need to be investing their money? And could that um, cause more problems for the economy, given that we're already facing a lot of uncertainty? Yeah, no, I think that that's a fair point. Of course, the uh, US economy is part of a global, econ you know, a global economic system. Um, we depend on exports, imports in order to um, actually move to our potential economic, uh, economic state and economic growth. So yeah, you can't ignore the effects of, um, of what is happening in other countries. And to your point, Greg, to, uh, you know, to the perception that other countries might have of our ability to actually move through this pandemic and get, uh, you know, get 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 the pandemic in a in a place uh, where it can be eliminated. And so, um, yeah, I, and I think that you're you're, you're going to start to see even more of those uh, global effects um, emerge as you start to see different countries uh, come out of the pandemic um, at a different pace than others. Um, already, you know, just a very simple economic, you know, effect is that you know. Um, Americans can't go to other countries. I mean, are, are not permitted in to a lot of other countries, um, you know, other, other countries' economies uh, right now because we are perceived as, uh, you know, as contaminants. And uh, and that I think goes straight to you know to Professor Harvey's point, which is, you know, essentially you've got to get the uh, you've got to get the pandemic um, on the run before you can start to think about how the how the uh, economy is going to come back. So um, uh, yeah, so in, in short, 
global, uh, global perceptions matter, global differential rates of recovery matter, and this is all going to have an, an effect on our own ability to recover. Sure, thank you. Uh, Professor Fullenkamp, I would like to come to you now um, with this, this, this idea of the US as a, as a global citizen economically. You study remittances to other countries, um, and obviously there's an impact on the economies that depend on them, and they're apparently forecast to decline uh, by about 20% this year. What kind of effect could that have? What do you expect to see moving forward? Yeah, that's a great point. And, and that number that came out recently from the World Bank, I think that's a really believable number. And it squares with our experience during the global financial crisis as well. That was one of the rare times we see uh, remittances uh, decline worldwide. In fact, um, they have been a tremendous source of stable growth and insurance for, for millions of people around the world. So this is really super bad news for many, many countries that are remittance dependent. Um, I, th I think it's just a, it's it, like in the US, it, it's uh, the, the pandemic has, has uh, rained a lot of economic hardship and health hardship on people at the bottom of the income scale. And it's just the same thing, uh, only even worse for, for, for countries that receive a lot of remittances because they're, they're literally a lifeline for millions upon millions of people. So we're going to have, you know, if anything, you have, a, you have a triple whammy for those countries instead of just the double whammy that most kind of countries are experiencing. They're going to experience the loss of economic activity, the, the increased health threats, because, especially because they have in, gen, in general a, a poor control of the, of the coronavirus. And also then they have the loss of, of remittances. And we see this in remittance, big remittance corridors all across the world, not just between, say, the U.S. and Latin America, especially Central America, but, but between uh, the Middle East and uh, the surrounding countries, the Middle East, the, the Middle East and, and Southeast Asia. So, so this is really going to uh, spread the hardship and, again, prolong the, the amount of time we're going to spend in, in this generally depressed state. Thank you very much. We have uh, another raised hand. Um, and so uh, before we get to that, I'd just like to remind everybody you can pose questions in the Q&A uh, or you can raise your hand in Zoom for us to unmute you so you can ask a question. And if you are joining by phone, you can hit star nine uh, to have us raise your, uh, uh, unmute you so you can ask the question. Um, and so I gather that we have a, uh, a question here in, um, or a raised hand here uh, in the chat uh, from Dwayne Patterson. Uh, Dwayne, you are now unmuted, so please tell us who you're with and pose your question, please. Uh, yes, uh, I'm with the North Carolina Pandemic Recovery Office here in uh, Raleigh, and assuming that one day we do solve the testing issue, what are some of the positive opportunities that may come out of the pandem pandemic uh, that we can look for in the longer term, the efficiencies that can be garnered from working from home or implementation of comprehensive broadband or other things that we can hope for one day we'll, we'll be in a better place. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Uh, anybody wanna, I've got any thoughts on that to start us off? Yeah, I definitely do. So um, it is naive to think that after we're through this, that we can safely think that we're gonna wait 102 years for the next pandemic. So 102 years ago, we had the Spanish flu and it was much more serious than what we're going through in terms of uh, death rate. So I consider what we're going through and I certainly hope our policymakers will also have this view. I consider this a fire drill. The next one is not gonna be a hundred years away. It could be much closer. And indeed, we've had scares with SARS, with MERS and, and other um, biological issues. So it is crucial that we learn from this episode. We don't brush it away and say, well, that's for the next generation or the generation after that, we're done. No, the next pandemic could be much more serious and it could be sooner rather than later. So what does this mean? Well, I certainly hope that our policymakers learn from the catastrophic failure that we've seen in public health response, that we need a system that's ready to deploy very quickly in terms of widespread testing. That's gotta be ready to go immediately. The other thing is that we were able to map the DNA of the COVID-19 
in two weeks. Why do we have to wait a year and a half for a vaccine? Well, traditionally, that's the time that it actually takes. But surely we can do better. And that means an investment in research and development. So I think that it is crucial that some funding is directed towards what I call kind of global risk management. And that means that we have the technologies in place whereby we can map the DNA quickly of a virus and then quickly move to a vaccine situation. There's obviously other things that are crucial in terms of the public health response that we have basically not invested in this over the long term because we haven't seen the threat. This is uh, what I call a systemic risk. It is a risk that's very difficult uh, to hedge, but there's certain things you can do. And we should take this episode as the fire drill and make sure that we're in a better position in the future. We've seen the economic carnage and it is very significant. We've seen the tragic loss of life. We've seen people that don't have the disease thrown out of a job that the damage is, is very important to them also in terms of their, uh, their family life, their personal mental uh, well-being. And that's really hard to quantify. We can count people that are out of work but it's really difficult to count the social and personal damage of this. So we need a new policy, a national health policy that will put us in a far better position in the future when this happens again, and it will happen again. Thank you, Professor Harvey. Uh, appreciate that. I'm going to move on. We've got uh, just a few minutes left here, and there were a few more things I wanted to, to hear. I wanted to come back, Professor Fullenkamp, uh, I want to come back to you and something you mentioned in your opening remarks. I know you've done some work on with regard to the need for a comprehensive relief package for rental housing and maybe even homeowners. Can you um, kind of dig into that a little bit and tell us why it's so important? I think it's important because because we've really been ignoring the problem. We, we have basically put a Band-Aid over that. And, I, and it gets back to uh, uh, what, what Sarah was talking about in her opening statement as well. We, we, we came out with a, with a package of mishmash of kind of half efforts to uh, paper things over because at the first, at, at back in March, we thought that this thing would be over by the end of the summer, I think. So we need to go back and say, okay, this is a long-term situation and, and people who are really going to be hurting because we, they've exhausted their short-term resources. So it really is a matter of thinking about how do, how, how do rental per payments percolate through the system? How do mortgage payments percolate through the system? Who are all the parties involved? How can we, how can we deliver effective relief there? I think um, it, it would take a little bit of, of, of time to look through that, but what we need to do is, is apply some targeted relief that can then percolate through the rest of the system fairly quickly so that we can give people the targeted assistance that we need. Um, it, it, so, so my point is that it's got to go way beyond things like temporary forgiveness or postponing rent, uh, rental and mortgage payments to some real relief packages that, again, getting back to Cam's point, this really isn't these, these folks' fault. And, and so we shouldn't hold them accountable as if it were. And we need, we need them to really make sure that everybody who has a stake in, the, in, this, in these ecosystems, the rental ecosystem and the mortgage ecosystem can, can make it through this uh, and, and come out on the other side and still be whole and still have a, a decent place to live. Gotcha. Thank you very much. And um, Professor Raskin, I wanted to kind of bounce that back to you. You talked again in your opening remarks uh, about a number of steps that needed to be taken. Um, there's, you know, there's been some discussion in the public sphere about uh, relief for corporations versus the kind of relief, direct relief for people that can't make their rent payments. Um, do you think there's a balance there when somebody says, well, what's better for the economy, you know, to give uh, corporations um, a lot of money, which some people see as just giving money to rich people, but other people are going to see as, okay, you're keeping the economy moving uh, versus uh, helping people keep a roof over their head and their families fed. Where's the balance there? Right. So, I mean, of course, the economy is this complex, dynamic, you know, almost organism where, you know, 
every, every piece of it really, really matters. And I, I, I really liked uh, this idea of a comprehensive relief package for renters. Um, I think that uh, I think that's spot on. Um, I think it um, has it, it would have a very strong, you know, so-called return on investment. Like those would be dollars very well spent, um, you know, from the perspective of uh, of an inclusive and um, and 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 and, uh, and and a recovery that will have real traction. So you know, to me, it's this idea of traction. I mean, you can spend you know you can spend a lot of money and just have a you know an, a, you know sort of a sugar high. Uh, but what you really want to do is you want to combine an understanding of. The, sort of where the structural weaknesses are, where the needs are greatest, and spend the money in those places. Now, in terms of this balance between, you know, spending on, you know, huge corporations versus, um, you know, versus households, I mean, we, we have to, we, we you know, we, we don't want to get hung up here in terms of, you know, sort of pitting these factors against each other. But what we do need to do is understand whether this money is being spent effectively, right? So if you, if you, you know, essentially create programs that are bailing out industries, but don't um, uh, actually tie that money to the condition of saying, you know, like hanging on to jobs or doing something that is going to make the value of that dollar spent really meaningful in terms of recovering the economy, then I think, you know, then I think you're missing something. So we do have to look at all of these, um, you know, all of all of this spending, I think, very, um, you know, very judiciously, uh, not with an eye of, you know, saying it's time for austerity, because it's not, but with an eye towards figuring out whether we are, we are, we are getting the, the, the economic support and assistance to where it's needed most. Um, I think, you know, I think that the, you know, the renter piece is just, is just brilliant. There is need there. Um, that would be, uh, if it is not addressed, we know what can happen. It can certainly lead to much greater degrees of homelessness, financial anxiety, economic insecurity, and of course, can spill into the financial sector and the providers of, um, of financing for for uh, you know, for rental units. So I think I think that's a great a great idea. And and there are other, by the way, there are other pockets uh, that we need to be addressing. Not just you know not just evictions, but looking at foreclosures, looking at student loan debt, looking at um, you know, again pieces here that uh, that that are going to require much more than just throwing throwing easy dollars. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Uh, we are almost at time. So I'm going to go through our panelists one more time and, and give you each an opportunity just in 30 seconds or less to emphasize the one thing. And again, I know you're economists and these things are never simple, but the one thing that you would really like to see happen today uh, in order to start the ball rolling in the, in the right direction. And I, I'm sure this will involve reiterating some of your previous points and that's fine, but I just want to give you the chance to reemphasize one more time briefly uh, what you'd like to see happen most. And uh, Professor Harvey, we'll start with you. Thank you. So it's interesting to me, the policy debate is between how much going to individuals versus corporations, or whether it's $400 a week or $600 a week, a stimulus check that's $1,200 or $2,000. To me, the ordering is incorrect. The number one priority is to mitigate the spread of this virus. We should be talking about number one, investing in testing where everybody is tested. It doesn't matter if you've got symptoms or not, you're tested once a week. Then people will resolve the uncertainty. We get back to work. It's better to do the testing and resolve the uncertainty than to be paying people um, not to be employed. So I understand the insurance function. I understand that people need to be helped out, but we six months into it, and it's much more effective to put people back to work. And we've got the technology to do that. And it is, uh, it is inexplicable to me that we have not invested a historical amount of money, of course, in testing, because testing can substantially mitigate this crisis. And again, we're six months in, this isn't rocket science. This is pretty straightforward, but it's not being done and we are faced with massive expenditures to support corporations, to support people, and we got to pay that back in the future, and that's going to take a bite out of economic growth in the future. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Raskin, your final thought there. Right. I mean, very, very simply, we have to um, create a plan to eliminate the pandemic in the US, and we have to restore economic support and make it meaningful so that people can move forward in their lives. Thank you very much. And Professor Fullenkamp, uh, same question to you. Yes, I, I, I would just concur with the other panelists. We need the government to exercise real leadership in terms of reducing the uncertainty about, about the coronavirus. Things like, things like testing, but also just even knowing something simple like, what is the true lethality of the virus? We don't even really know that. Where are we at in terms of the spread? Uh, what, what are the real risks of going out and doing your business on a day-to-day -day basis? We need the government to step up, provide that leadership immediately. In addition, though, we do need to support the rest of the economy. And as, we, as we've been talking about, starting with the, the main expenditure that most people have, which is for their shelter, is an excellent place to start. And actually, it's overdue. Thank you very much, Professor Willenkamp. We will leave it there. We're at 11 o'clock. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks ever so much to our panelists, Campbell Harvey, Sarah Bloom Raskin, and Connell Fullenkamp for sharing your perspectives and your passion this morning. Uh, our next briefing is in an hour, uh, at noon today, when we'll be discussing Duke research on how to test the effectiveness of masks. Guess what? They work, but not all face coverings are created equal. If you'd like to attend that briefing, please email dukenews at duke.edu. In the meantime, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and please stay well. Have a great day.